the best way to be in the conversation is to never leave it. Today, we are talking about the Beatles and how they've been able to maintain relevance and uphold it, even though they've been broken up for more than 50 years. And more specifically still, how they have striking similarities to Michael Jordan. If you're new here, my name is Derek G. Nice to meet you. Let's get started. For those of you who don't know, I'm quite a basketball fan, and I see a lot of similarities between music and basketball, which might seem like polar opposites on the surface. But when you liken coaches to producers, bands to teams, organizations to labels, and fans to fans, it starts making sense. And the comparison I want to draw today is between the two greatest to ever do it, Michael Jordan and the Beatles. And you can have GOATS greatest of all time in every field, whether it's Hitchcock and Kubrick in film, whether it's Childs and Blumenthal in cooking, but there are two entities that remain at the peak of the mountain in their respective categories, Michael Jordan and the Beatles. But despite what you might think, this isn't just about talent and stats alone, because even that can be subjective. I'd argue instead, this has everything to do with marketing. And this thought process first started when this new single of the Beatles came out called Now and Then, their last single, quote unquote. And with this release, it reminded me how the Beatles have always, always been in the conversation. They've never left. And it had me thinking about how similar this story is to Michael Jordan. The year was 2020 and Netflix released a 10 part exhaustive documentary series of Michael Jordan called The Last Dance. And it was one of those series like Drives to Survive, where you don't need to be a sports fan to relate to this epic, epic battle and struggle for greatness. It told the story of ambition, of competitiveness and proving people wrong. And I and many, many people loved it. But what I found most interesting about this documentary was the discourse afterwards, because pundits, commentators, fans were all saying the same thing, that there was an ulterior motive to this documentary. You see, it was speculated that the timing of this documentary dropping was very strategic and was aimed to achieve three things. One, to introduce Michael Jordan to a younger generation who didn't live through his greatness. Two, to remind the older generation who might have lived through the Jordan era about how great he was just in case their minds were foggy. And three, to blow out the candle of LeBron James that was burning bright in the argument of who is the greatest of all time. In 2020, LeBron James had just won his fourth championship. You see, LeBron being a freak of nature and winning multiple championships has led the league in multiple statistical categories and the debate started to rise. Is he the greatest of all time? But this wasn't happening on Jordan's watch. You see, this was not just a sports documentary, but essentially Jordan's propaganda. A way to own the narrative, a way to tell the story how you want it to be told. Michael Jordan was the greatest. No, Michael Jordan still is the greatest. And don't you forget that. But Derek, isn't being the greatest defined by wins, by championships? Isn't it relatively objective? If only. Let's take Bill Russell from the Boston Celtics, for example. He's won more championships than anyone in the 50s and 60s, and he has five more championships than Michael Jordan. You hear this narrative around Russell. The league was easier. The talent wasn't as good. Jordan won every time he went to the finals. Brand Russell is nowhere near as powerful as Brand Jordan. And the more you interrogate these questions, the more you realize the stories behind Jordan are much more cherry-picked to get to that result. So if you can't judge it off purely winning, what are we judging it off? the perception of greatness. Perception, how they embodied greatness, not just how they achieved it. And Michael Jordan has done the best of anyone at maintaining that perception of greatness on and off the court. Like I said, he had the last dance, which fanned the flames in the perception of his greatness. This year in 2023, he had a biographical sports drama directed by Ben Affleck telling the story of his rookie years and his deal with Nike, furthering this perception of greatness, of uniqueness. Of course, he has his sub-brand within Nike, Air Jordan, which has turned over $5.2 billion in 2022. And as well as that, he has sponsorships and shoe deals where he taps teams and athletes that represent greatness to represent Brand Jordan. Make no mistake, the Brand Jordan has put in so much time and effort to associating any great athlete with Jordan. Where am I going with this? Brand Jordan has and will continue to associate itself with greatness. And so does the Beatles. If I put out a random poll and ask people who is the greatest band of all time, not subjectively, but who do you think would represent the greatest band of all time? I would say 90 out of 100 would say the Beatles. Not the Rolling Stones, not U2, not Nirvana, but four lads from Liverpool. And the general narrative that surrounds their greatness is as follows. The quality of their output over 10 years is unmatched. The shape shifting and genre pushing that occurred with each album. The pure influence that they had, whether it's through Beatlemania, mop top haircuts, Indian mysticism, or the garage rock movement is one of a kind. They have world records after world records and still hold being the highest selling group of all time. 
and the fact that they stood the test of time and fought off their rivals for 50 plus years. But this is by no means an accident. The legacy is the product of brand building, of business savvy, of maintaining relevance, which takes us to today, where the Beatles released their quote unquote final song that features an AI assisted John Lennon vocal, where the remaining Beatles revived a dusty John Lennon demo and rebranded it as a Beatles song. They branded it as a new old stock Beatles banger. That's the narrative anyway, because in actual fact, this was a John Lennon solo song that he wrote in roughly 1977 and was given to Paul, George and Ringo by Yoko Ono in 1994, with her blessing to turn it into a Beatles song. So the story of the final Beatles song is in fact marketing. It's a John Lennon rough demo that the remaining Beatles, including George at one point, have repackaged. For what reason? To maintain relevance. It's giving something new to existing Beatles fans. It's giving new Beatles music to young fans that never experienced new Beatles alongside with everyone else. And it allows them to continue being part of the conversation. In my opinion, it doesn't really matter what the song sounded like, but rather how compelling was the story that they were trying to tell? And the last song is a pretty damn compelling story. The foundation of Brand Beatles started with the founding of Apple Core, which was formed 55 years ago in 1968. Apple Core was primarily started to lower the taxable income of the group, but has now become the central hub, the umbrella brand of the Beatles. It is their Unilever, it is their LVMH. And early on, Apple Core had all the hallmarks of being a ambitious media brand. They had a record label that signed people like James Taylor and Bill Preston. They dabbled in Apple retail, Apple films, Apple publishing, and even had their own Apple studios. But that all started to get a bit messy when the band started to deteriorate. And it was helmed at the top by a single individual, their former road manager, Neil Aspinall from 1970 to 2007. And I would argue during this time, his biggest impact was protecting brand Beatle with a lot of lawsuits. Most famously with Apple computers, of course, with Apple iTunes and their label, EMI. He also led and executive produced their well-known Beatles anthology in 1995. But I think brand Beatle really started to pick up steam with the succession of the CEO role with Jeff Jones, who came into power for Apple Core in 2007 and remains at the helm to this day. He came with a background of marketing having worked with Columbia, MCA, Polygram, Electra, and Sony, and later he served as VP of Legacy for 12 years. In total, he arrived with 30 plus years of marketing know-how. In stating Jones did wonders for the Beatles brand, as now they had not a road manager running their business, but a commercial and marketing leader whose number one goal is to market, maintain, and increase the value of the Beatles. He helped the Beatles to be part of the conversation through a multitude of examples and generations, including protecting the work from overuse. If you go to TikTok, for example, there are very few Beatles songs available to use, so they're not plastered with every single TikTok of someone cleaning their bathroom. He's also protecting them from oversampling. How often have you heard big Beatles tracks on big rap songs? Hardly ever, because they don't allow it. He also protected them from over licensing. They're very protective over how the Beatles are used in TV, commercial and film. And one prime example is that the first time Tomorrow Never Knows was licensed for TV was on Mad Men many, many years after the song had come out. He's helped the Beatles navigate the streaming era, knowing that the Beatles don't have to be the first to the platform. And he's overseeing this frequency of releases, including the Beatles mono box set, the Beatles stereo box set, my personal favorite, the collaborative Cirque du Soleil Love album, which I thought was really good. The continual remastering for CD, for iTunes, for vinyl, and of course, the latest final single, Now and Then. And that's to name just a few. What Jones has been able to achieve is a surgically executed, long-term, multi-decade marketing plan where the Beatles control the narrative. They call the shots. You see, they aren't overused, they aren't overmarketed, and instead they have a tasteful relevance with every generation that passes. And this hard work pays off. It's reported that annually Apple Core earns about 60 million US dollars a year, which is a lot considering the band broke up more than 50 years ago. And this excludes anything from the Lennon estate, McCartney estate, etc. And while you could argue, couldn't they earn more? I would also argue that they want to be earning $60 million plus for 50 more years to come. The difference is this, while the Rolling Stones continue to release albums and say, hey, we're still hip, the Beatles are playing a different game by tastefully cementing their footing as the greatest to ever live rather than the greatest right now. Before we move any further, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's episode, Turntable Lab. 
Turntable Lab is the place to go for all of your hi-fi needs, whether you are an enthusiast or a beginner, anything and everything, whether it's a rotary mixer, whether it's sleeves for your records, a turntable stand, or as much vinyl as you could possibly imagine. Trust me, if you want it, they've got it for all of your needs, including buying records. They have over 100,000 records in their catalog. And if you buy four or more records, you can take advantage of their four or more deal where you can take 10% off. So check it out at turntablelab.com and you can head to the link in the description where you can find a selection of my favorite things in the store. Okay, let's talk about potential risks and opportunities. One of the bigger risks is this, that the music is only getting older. And if you compare the Beatles to say our generation's ears of listening to toe tapping, knee slapping, ragtime music from the twenties, will there come a day where the Beatles music just sounds too old. Other threats include the ever-present threat of an equivalent of the LeBron James coming along to take the Beatles' crown. But I think the biggest risk surrounding the Beatles revolves around successes and spokespeople. Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, Yoko Ono and Shaw Lennon are the surviving members and representatives of the brand. And as long as they're alive, they represent the voice and direction of the band. And as long as there is a Paul McCartney around with a twinkle in his eye to roll out every five years, the Beatles' magic will remain. And they've also brought in Giles Martin, the son of the Beatles producer, George Martin, to be another proxy and spokesperson for the band, keeping up the mythology of the band, even though he didn't work on their music back in the 60s. And of course, there's Jeff Jones, who has poured his heart and soul into the Beatles in is essentially at this point, the fifth Beatles, or maybe the sixth after Yoko. Interestingly, when doing research for this, I didn't find that it was a visible representative for George Harrison, which actually seems very George Harrison. And despite a few poor choices of what they've released along the way, I think they've done an incredible job. The Get Back documentary was handled beautifully and shone a light on a different side of the Beatles that we'd never seen before. And tapping director Peter Jackson to execute on this further adds to the brand's prestige. But by comparison, the now and then AI experiment and ensuing music video isn't great in my opinion. The music video is a little bit of a train crash of superimposed archival footage, poor lighting and worse styling, and I don't think represents the band in a great light. And the song itself, while okay, is the surviving Beatles acting as early Beatles when in fact it's a John Lennon song. And the question that looms is this, what happens when the members and the spokespeople go? And the other question is, are they the best people to make decisions for the brand moving forward? It will be imperative for them to find a new leader beyond McCartney, Starr, Ono or Jones who can take the reins and tell their story for generations to come. What can the Beatles learn from Jordan Brand and how he's been able to stamp out all competition at scale and en masse? Because sure, 60 million per year is a lot of money, but it's no 5.2 billion. And how can they ensure bands like Radiohead don't rewrite the Beatles history and become the most important British group of all time? How do we know that Radiohead doesn't have a slew of unreleased music and documentaries in the works right now? So let me have a bit of fun and see ways in which the Beatles could extend their universe beyond their music for many years to come, for another 50 years. And sure, I admit the Beatles might not want any of this. Maybe they just want to work on the music and not become a commercial enterprise. But I have a funny feeling they don't want that. And I have to preface this by saying I don't want all of these things to happen, but I also think it could be likely. Sure, they're not a publicly listed company, but there is a world in which they want to diversify their streams of revenue. So Jordan Brand has media enterprises, has Air Jordan, has a slew of sponsorships with sports teams that represent greatness. Now, I don't see the Beatles brand following the exact same route because greatness is ever present in sport, whereas the Beatles are the main game. So in music specifically, I'm sure we can all expect continual remastering and reissues, which will happen infinitum as long as there are new formats for us to consume. Think metaverse, think spatial audio, think VR, think more AI powered demos. But what if the Beatles go down more of a universe route of Marvel, Harry Potter, or Star Wars? Documentaries and music dramas depicting different stages of the Beatles eras. For example, something like Netflix's The Crown where each season is a different era of the Beatles. That feels so likely to me. And then why can't they have spin-offs? So you have a Ringo spin-off, you have a Paul spin-off. The Beatles have dabbled in cartoons, so why can't they do that again for kids? And you can even have voiceovers that sound like each artist because of AI making it easier than ever. Or they could do something like the Haruki Murakami strategy where he has a tick-tock strategy. One year he has a silly little book where it's about his favorite t-shirts, his favorite records, and then the next year he'll have a more serious release. So why can't you have every three to six months a short film, a cartoon, a documentary, 
a movie. The list is endless because the universe is so deep. I don't think it's impossible to imagine a world in which once the original members pass that Apple Core becomes a brand almost like Lucasfilm, where the lore of the Beatles is harvested for every last organ. <laughs> And I'll conclude with this, in a world in which Kanye West can spin up a billion dollar merchandise business with the help of Adidas, it's not out of the realms that the Beatles can be an even bigger business in years to come, where tens of millions can turn into billions. Because how has Michael Jordan maintained relevance? By reminding fans that his tenacity and unrivaled competitiveness makes him the greatest regardless of any statistical metric. And how can the Beatles maintain their idea of greatness? By giving generations now and forever the language and content to articulate that it is not possible to have another group as great as the Beatles. And that has nothing to do with fact or reality, but marketing and storytelling. I wanted to fit in a Beatles song name somewhere, so I'm going to do it right at the end. They said, can't buy me love. Fine, but they can sure as hell market it. If you like what you saw, if you like what I do, please feel free to leave a comment, a like, or subscribe. And thanks for watching.